Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio, a board game podcast coming to you from three thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. You might want to say that again. Uh, hello again. Yep, got you that time. And Kara. Hey. With your host, Fen. And today we're going to be talking about... With your host, Fen. And today we're going to be talking about, well, three very different games. Um, and uh, that should be pretty interesting. Uh, before we get into that, though, uh, it's time for the ever-present catch-up. So what's been up with you, Kara? Um, well, uh, well, uh, a lot actually. Um, I'm currently uh, taking off some time from work due to burnout. The whole Corona episode was kind of stressful. Um, using the time right now to, um, you know, just just been looking through boxes I had sitting around. You know, all the stuff I never had time to get to. Um, and also play some games again uh yeah so um that's something um and actually one thing i noticed when when last week when i played how difficult it can sometimes be with expansions because um like if you have an expansion that's not simple okay yeah this time i play with it and this time i play not with it because you have to you know swap out components and uh, and stuff and i actually had the expansions included in the game but then when i played with friends i thought well it's the first time and i don't want to explain too many uh, special rules so we just play the core game and we started and we stumbled over some expansion content all the time and had to house rule a lot spontaneously to to make it work somehow and that's really bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that happens with us ruling everything yeah there's a definite issue with there's like you play a lot of games and you you get the exp- play those expansions regardless and people will pick up with it no problem but the ones that add complexity can be a nightmare. I've been constructing starter decks for Arkham Horror, and that's like involved stripping a lot back and even drafting up a whole. These are these are the cards you're going to want as you level up through the. These are these are the cards you're going to want as you level up through the stories to keep these decks working, and then you can do your own thing with your own deck after you understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so that's uh, it's always fun. Yeah, yeah. Expansions. I mean, I like expansions. Don't get me wrong. I it's do. Just, I mean, I like expansions. Don't get me wrong. I it's do. Just, I think I, as you said, either it's expansions that fit in nicely and it's not a lot more to learn, or you can use them mod- modularly, like just take them out or put them in however and whenever you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say like. Um, one of my favorite expansions is the ketchup me- mechanism for food chain mangate but that's something you kind of play with only once you've played the base game a fair bit yeah uh, or uh, to, to just switch things up and change it because it with um like expansions with people who haven't played before and also like it's quite tough to play with people who've played less than you because that game rewards repeated plays but yeah it's um it's interesting. I was looking at the shelf of games that stays down here, and I was like, "How many of these have an expansion that oh, this one? That's not too hard for people to get to grips with." Some of the cards you can use the back, and that's more or less what they need to understand with it. Yeah, um, Canvas is basically the same game with another mechanic and a better way of scoring points. Yeah. Uh, Resar. Uh, Resar. Uh, Res, Ar- Res Arcana goes the same uh, mm. with both expansions. <laughs> it only gets better and it's just integrated. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that's 
that has something that a lot of Tumblr Man's designs have, which is what I was thinking with Race for the Galaxy, is yeah, you just kind of get, which is what I was thinking with Race for the Galaxy, is yeah, you just kind of get used to everything being stuck in there. But <laughs> for a new player, if I was going to teach Race, I'm going to strip it back down to the original deck. Yeah. Because it, because even though I'm like, oh, don't worry about anything that says Takeover and ignore anything that says Prestige, that's still too much because there's just noise on the because there's just noise on the card they're looking at and going, well, hang on, what's this purple symbol mean again? Or how do I take over something? It's like, remember, we're not doing takeovers, <laughs> so I strip it back to the beginning and say, this is the starting deck. Just remember, green planets good, <laughs> but blue planets and brown planets better. It, that, that's it, and maybe you can do well with some. Mid- that that uh, selecting expansions for uh, Race for the Galaxy is a mini game per se. I think that I never. Had the first game of someone with alien artifact in. Um, I I have a whole separate box for alien artifact, as in I have a co- I've set a second copy of Race for the Galaxy that <laughs> holds alien artifact. Big fact, and I'm just like, well, it's it's just a new game, so I did that, and then we never play it. We just play the original trilogy, quadrology. It's three sequels, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, expansions. <laughs> that's a that's a thing. I'm gonna be talking about some expansions today, which would be fun. Um, I've I, or some I've chopped a lot off just to, to lot off just to not talk about. Um, but yeah, we lionized this. Uh, Alessio, what have you been up to? Oh well, uh, I have to say this uh, this couple of weeks I've just been watching the world burn. I I, I think I had a look at the feedback. Uh, actually, of people lashing out and uh, Marvel zombie feedback. Uh, actually, of people lashing out and uh, Marvel zombie side. Uh, like, come on. I was going to bring that up to talk about if we didn't talk about it here. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, then I, I had a look at uh, Oddsworn ports, uh, in which actually the uh, they did uh, they did that good. Actually, the uh, they did uh, they did that good because uh, uh, Oddsworn two needed uh, a bit more uh, to, to overcharge shipping, basically. But they did uh, pretty better uh, by absorbing a part of the cost and then asking politely in exchange. Not only that, but when I went there to see like what the time frame was, they'd already addressed in the comments and said, hey, we're going to have it open for about five weeks. And I was like, brilliant, for more than a month. So that covers everybody's paydays. So if somebody's like, what the heck, you know, I've budgeted for this month already. I can't do this, then... Yeah, they, you can. Which is, it's a thing that while unpleasant, uh, it can be done. I, I think by 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 just here say that uh, that a lot of people are tipping more, so it's likely that uh, they won't even be be down those one hundred k. Who knows? Anyway, that, that's that's a lot of. Uh, of worrying news about shipping uh, this week, and I, I was looking into them. So <laughs> this is my week. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I was gonna say like the uh, some people have been reporting six hundred dollars in shipping for their with uh, um, Chronicles of Droga. Um, I can't remember the name fully even now, but the dungeon crawler that I backed because uh, one of one of my members of the community was like, this is really good. And I was, I had the finance at the time from my budget that I set for, we're going to kickstart stuff this year. And I was great extra. Wow. And I was like, no, I, that's, I, I only put up like $600. So what are you, well, how do you think that's reasonable? Find out they're an American company. They don't quote VAT in advance. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. What are you doing? This is on GameFound. It's a European platform. Found. It's a European platform. Ah. Um, eventually, I got most of my money back. They should have refunded the whole thing, but I wasn't going to fight them over the portion that they said they're not going to refund because it's too much hassle for like fifty dollars or whatever it was. I mean, it's fifty dollars I don't have anymore, but I guess I mean it's fifty dollars I don't have anymore, but I guess I take that as the price of giving it a go and and they'd be like no which is a bit of a contrast compared to my experiences with doomtown where i had a heck of a time and then they went hey it's just going to be 50 dollars shipping and i was like wow yes 50 dollars shipping and i was like wow yes fine fine i don't need a refund <laughs> that's okay i i've seen shipping costs have gone up the, the bad one was this week um 
I just paid my shipping for Chai, uh, T for Two, which uh, is a lovely little two-player game, uh, which uh, is a lovely little two-player game. Uh, I really like it. it. It only costs $40, and shipping has cost me $30. There, there's, a board, there's a board game for everything anyway. Chai, a game about tea. <laughs> yeah. About tea, shipping tea, yeah. It, it's it's a love, lovely game, lovely little two-player game. And I'm shipping tea, yeah. It, it's it's a love, lovely game, lovely little two-player game. And I was like, you know what, it's cheap, and I don't mind supporting that. And then the shipping costs spiralled, and here we are. Yep. What about you, fan? Um, I've mostly been catching up on my Arkham Horror, uh, getting that sort of guests coming next month, and uh, we want to play some Arkham, so I've been tuning starting decks, and that's involved a lot of like research and annoyance, because the old way that they distributed the Arkham cards was terrible. I'll probably talk about it later this year, until the best time to get into the game because the new distribution is much better than the old like yeah they're the, the, the doing a great job even with war of the ring is the other game from fg oh, i played war of the, the ring ages ago war of the ring sorry um no the Lib lords of the rings the card game exhausting because the only way to win some of the scenarios was to build endlessly self-recycling decks and I was like, I'm not here to shuffle all of my deck back in for the fifth time <laughs> uh, just to replenish my reserves so I can make it through the second scenario in this campaign story. Yeah, get rid of that stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, War of the Ring I played. Get rid of that stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, War of the Ring I played. I didn't like it. Oh, uh, I like the, the, the Knizia version of the confrontation. It's uh, quick. It's easy. It's great. <laughs> Oh, um, that's the one that's a bit like Stratego, isn't it? Where you've got like hidden. It's a bit like Stratego, isn't it? Where you've got like hidden information on the back of your yeah um, pieces. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. Stratego, kind of with addition of some war version of hidden movement. It's it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, um, I like the one where you play as the hobbits because I can be Fatty Bolger, who's the hero of the whole. Who's the hero of the whole tale. My favorite Hobbit. He, he, he did the terrifying thing of staying home and pretending to be Frodo. Like, that took some stones. Oh, no worries. You guys can run and hide from the ring race. I'm going to face them as the person that they think is ass the whole time. Plus, he's orange in the game. We, we touched a few topics in this catch-up. Mm. <laughs> yeah, just a few. Just a few. Um... Apart from that, it's been finishing touches on the guest house, which I've talked about before, so I won't get into it. And the joyous fun of I still can't play Final Girl. Ordered my Kickstarter through the local gaming store rather than direct, because that turns out to be just better for me on the shipping costs, i.e. I don't have any shipping costs, because the value is enough that they ship it from the mainland to me for no cost, so I just have to wait a bit. It's how I got Sleeping Gods. It's how I got Nemesis, Gods. It's how I got Nemesis. Um, and it means I don't have to pay attention to Kickstarters as closely. But every once in a while, things go a bit wobbly. And what's happened here is they've received the Final Girl core game. Um, and they've shipped that to me. Uh, um, and they've shipped that to me. Uh, and that happened, like, last month or the month before. And... It turns out you can't do anything with the core game. It's the rules, but you always need a feature box to play, which strikes me as the, the one of the dumbest pieces of distribution I've ever heard of. The dumbest pieces of distribution I've ever heard of. Why is it not packaged with a feature box as standard? One feature box. Yeah. The, you know. <clears throat> so, like, if you think about it for people at retail, this is going to be sitting on the shelf, and some people are going to come in and go, well, I want to get Final Girl, and they'll pick up the core box and get told, oh, sorry, there's no feature boxes they can't play. Or, there's no core, going to end up with some dead stock if you're stocking this. I just, no. But, just to make it a little better, I, I was told, oh, we're going to put in with your new order for this month, um, because I ordered a few Arkham cards to, like, support a deck that I wanted to build. Uh, and uh, they're like, oh, we can send you some of your final copies of the core game. I need to sort out <laughs> somehow sending it back because somewhere their wires got crossed because it's so confusing. Uh, it's still in the cellophane wrap, but <laughs> I'm like, 
I don't know what to do because it would cost me like about 20 euros to send it back to the mainland. So I'm still waiting for them to tell me what they what they want me to do with it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. So um, eventually I'll be talking about Final Girl when I actually get to play it. Um, and, uh, I, uh, you know, my points here about the distribution method and this is just here about the distribution method and this is just yeah uh if you're gonna get it like just just make sure you buy a couple of feature boxes in advance and keep a track of what you're supposed to have because it's confusing and silly and yeah if you think about unsettled uh, it works the same way but you have a couple if you think about unsettled uh, it works the same way but you have a couple of planets in the core game yeah, it just makes sense. You want to be able to buy one box off the shelf and take it home and be, yes, I can play with this. And and then you can come back and get a few more expansions. And, you know, like Unsettled is really well done expansion boxes because you can only put two in the main box and the rest are really odd shapes. I haven't found a, a good place that looks nice to store them yet. And the great thing is with the second Kickstarter, there are two additional expansion boxes that don't feature new planets that have a different size. Again. We they... did not know we were getting more odd shaped boxes. Yeah, two more. <laughs> this, is get, this is getting as bad as too many bones, but at least they released a like Kallax fitting chest to put everything in. Well, yeah. just, just wait, give them time. I mean, uh, for vindication they did release uh, or, or not yet released but they do create this big box for everything wouldn't surprise me if at some point they did the same for unsettled yeah i hope so i'm still waiting for for vindication i think i backed on the reprint um yeah me too yeah um mm. no news yeah, for quite game. some time now it has been very quiet yeah and uh, i think the last thing is time now it has been very quiet, yeah. And uh, I think the last thing is that Margot, Margot and um, Root arrived. Yeah. And I got everything to fit inside my Laser Ox wooden chest with all trays. Uh, you will be very careful when you lift the lid off because one of the trays just... Uh, you will be very careful when you lift the lid off because one of the trays just sits in the in space where the lid is, which originally held the boards. And then I have all the boards in another box, so... Uh, I've got root to fit into every into one thing. Uh, I would prefer them to make a big coffin box themselves, but I know they're kind of against that. Yeah, that Patrick Leather promised us with the next Kickstarter, which should be the last two factions for root to to make a big box fitting everything. I'm kind of I'm kind of waiting on that because I am overwhelmed by root boxes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. It's it's like the classic problem. The box. Ex yeah. I would buy the box expansions with uh, which will which would only feature a box. Yeah. If they do a nice all in one box, and I mean, let's face it, they have to cap the number of factions they're putting into root because the interactions you have to test are just crazy. Yeah. Like, like uh, now, orders are the rats are in respect to try to deal with the vagabond problem. By actually interfacing with items and you know like yeah just, just, what, just get rid of vagabonds entirely put them they're in the role-playing game you don't need them in the board game no uh, actually with advanced with, with advanced setup and uh, actually with advanced with, with advanced setup and uh, irelings uh, you can make and the landmarks uh, you you can uh, the, the the amount of choice you have is staggering <laughs> i think i i can play every future uh, future game of root i play could be completely different from one another I think what I play could be completely different from one another. I think, I think there's en enough variety for how much alive. I know. I, I was amazed they even added rules for playing with the ferry on <laughs> maps that aren't just the lake, which is like, okay, cool. I mean, fine. I've yeah. already got to that. Okay, cool. I mean, fine. I've yeah. already got to that. So, so great. Now the. Uh, now the otters have to compete with the bloody ferry on every map. Brilliant. <laughs> I guess I guess river boats is remaining at one whenever I play as the otter company from now on because uh, <laughs> yeah. nobody wants to use them anyway most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to use them anyway most of the time. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, I think that's enough, and we should get onto our main talk picks. Uh, so we're going to look at the look at a board game interpretation of a classic story. So, Lesio, tell us all about Jekyll and Hyde. Oh yeah, uh, actually, I'll talk about Jekyll and Hyde. Oh yeah, uh, actually, I'll talk about the board game interpretation of the classic story. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Jekyll versus Hyde is a two-player trick-taking card game. Uh, is uh, designed by Gion Hill, I hope uh, to pronounce him right. The art is, by, is published by Mandu Games. Okay, uh, these are the coordinates. Now, in this game, you are two players playing. One player plays as Dr. Jekyll, while another player is Mr. Hyde. The entire confrontation is in the head of Dr. Jekyll. There is uh, one central tag, seven spaces, which go from Jekyll to Hyde and uh, you have an initial marker called uh, the identity marker which is a pretty cool metal bust of Dr. Jekyll which is placed in the track all the way to the Jekyll side now if does do, yeah. hang on does <laughs> unfortunately oh, no, no. They, they missed a trick there yeah okay. yeah that, 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 that was a missed opportunity <laughs> anyway he, uh, the players move this marker tag of war style but uh, it is only Hyde who does the, pull, the pulling. Actually, Jekyll can only resist being past position in the track all the way to Hyde. The Hyde player wins. Conversely, if Jekyll can resist three turns, Jekyll wins. This is the basic of the game. How do you move the identity marker? You play a trick-taking turn with a hand of ten cards. Uh, now playing. You have three suits with uh, various ranks, uh, you aren't forced to follow suit, and uh, the highest rank of the highest suit wins the trick. Now, uh, there is a twist here, and it's pretty smart, and it's actually all that makes this game good, this game good to me. At the end of the turn, when, when all tricks uh, have been won by someone, you count the tricks uh, which were won by each player and move the marker a, num a number of places equal to the absolute difference between the players. So, if for the absolute difference between the players. So, if for, for instance, if uh, I'd scored seven tricks and uh, Jekyll scored three tricks, the difference is four, you move the marker four tracks. Since there are 11 spaces, and uh, you have only in you have three there are 11 spaces and uh, you have only in you have three turns to play that is pretty bad <laughs> so uh, basically this is the asymmetry in the game because jekyll wants to achieve maximum balance the ideal play for jekyll will be five and five tricks taken by jekyll and hyde while hyde did disruption of this in one way or the other if uh, hyde loses all uh, tricks or wins all tricks it's still moving 10 spaces towards hide so uh, that's basically it that's uh, the coolest part of the game and that and that's what makes it interesting things to know when playing like uh, there's uh, the fact that the various suits uh, have no fixed hierarchy but their power is decided by the order of play uh, the Every, every turn is uh, started by Jekyll, and Jekyll can play a color. The color representing a scene, uh, if I remember correctly, red is uh, anger, uh, and green is envy, and purple is avarice, or something like that, because I got the Italian version. <laughs> um, well, they seem to have, the symbols on them appear to be an avid. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's it. And uh, uh, when uh, when you play the first trick, that is the least powerful trick. Then uh, the second trick played is the middle one, and the last uh, trick uh, appearing is the most powerful, even in the order of trick taking. Because I'd could make something like sacrifice a move uh, in order. To get another trick he has plenty of uh, more powerful for instance 
and Jekyll can counteract this because if uh, uh, Hyde goes that way, uh, if uh, Hyde goes that way, uh, it could happen that you can insist on playing that trick even to a detriment to you because you don't really want, uh, for instance, red to be the most powerful that uh, turn. So there's actually uh, this is a small decision which makes a lot of there's actually uh, this is a small decision which makes a lot of difference in the game and the second the second thing is that there are not exactly trump cards but there are potions which are colorless and you decide the color when you play them and they look like custard yeah yeah exactly they look like custard yeah yeah exactly and uh, you get uh, these potions, and depending on the color of the potion which is get which uh, uh, has been played, uh, you activate an F. Uh, the winner of the trick activates a value. They cannot uh, have the highest value ever, but you can give them. Uh, you can declare them as a color for the purpose of winning the trick. Uh, the potions can do basically anything. Uh, you can steal two, t two tricks, uh, one by the other player. You can kind of the initial draft of the cards. Or you can just uh, remix all the, all the colors of the suits and have them uh, rebalanced again against the next play. So basically, uh, you get the idea. The idea. This is the. Uh, this is a twenty-minute game between two players. It's extremely tense because you are never sure of if you are winning, even if you are executing your plan perfectly. It's fast-paced and has compelling decisions, which can be countered at every step. It plays fast, which can be countered at every step. It plays fast, and you always want to play once more <laughs> now i i really like this game i i just want to say that it is rare to see a game uh, in which every move counts uh, in which every move counts uh, it's not like you play perfectly but in the end uh, your lucky opponent wins the opponent's has to put effort in trying to beat your strategy they always have the chance of doing something to distract you but always not uh, banal not evident uh, it's very interesting and uh, I, I have to say as a fan of mechanics uh, that's pretty smart as a trick taking game <laughs> now the speaking of Anne Dutre which is basically saying uh, it's beautiful. It's a gorgeous game with beautiful art. Uh, the the metal bust is uh, is uh, I wouldn't believe it's heavy. It's a nice old metal bust. It's it's great. You could say that uh, the game is extremely lack of cards. The track with three cardboard tokens and this metal bust, and it costs like uh, fifteen to twenty five euros depending on the deal you get. So you can object it's expensive, but it's not absolutely expensive. So it's uh, kind of uh, uh, I could also say that. Uh, Playing as Jekyll is way more difficult as playing uh, than playing as Hyde. So actually, it could happen that if you get repeated uh, Jekyll plays and your opponent is somewhat competent, frustrated. So I I suggest to play to play a round of one player plays Jekyll, the other player plays Jekyll next turn, and only if one win wins both games uh, uh, can. Uh, be the winner <laughs> because otherwise uh, some people especially the most competitive ones get frustrated especially the most competitive ones get frustrated this has one downside i observated <laughs> which is uh, if i play jekyll denied then jekyll denied then jekyll denied i never happen to perform well because i keep switching my attitude towards towards card so this has i keep switching my attitude towards towards card so these are these are downsides but it's fun uh, one 
one other important thing to know it's longevity this game is uh, has the same longevity as your generic this game is uh, has the same longevity as your generic uh, trick uh, taking card game so uh, you get it you play it for uh, 10 12 20 games uh, one after another because it's pretty fast then uh, you shelf it uh, you shelf until the time you you get it back again and you still begin playing a lot of games because that it's so cool so that's basically it in a nutshell <laughs> i don't know if you have any questions or observation or something uh basically i like a lot the mechanic which work well i had one observation which is it seems almost inevitable someone's going to retheme this as banner versus hulk <laughs> and secondly um it is it is it a tug of war uh, so much or is it like a resistance versus being pulled situation yeah it's more a resistance uh, versus being pulled actually i use tug of war because uh, uh, the term in italian uh, uh, tiro la fune which is the actual game of tug of war can be used both to meaning you just drag and someone resists or both drag <laughs> it's the same you just drag and someone resists or both drag it's the same it's the same game with two variants of rules so i use the same term but it's resistance oh. yeah hmm. Right, right, yeah. Okay, I got it. So it's a bit like how I think it's in German that snails and slugs have the same name. Snails and slugs? German that snails and slugs have the same name. Snails and slugs? Oh yeah, uh, actually kind of in Italian too. They are called the lumache. Uh, we call the, the snails uh, chiocciole, but it's kind of same stuff, yeah. <laughs> hmm, hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the own royal visit... And I'm not super hot on trick taking games. Um, should I? Should I? Is there anything that's going to hook me on this? Because like Royal Visit is my preferred tug of war style two player game. Oh, uh, actually, if you are, uh, I am not that fond of t of uh, trick taking games myself. You to this game could be the the initial phase of drafting, which is you are dealt uh, cards and you have. To choose uh, two cards you have to give to your opponent and uh, your opponent does the same, which is a pretty psychological moment, especially because if you have uh, two potions, force to include a potions to give uh, to your opponent. So since uh, if you are the Jekyll player, you have to plan everything ahead, uh, this could be quite uh, disrupting and could be a big mind game. So that could be a draw. Uh, to the game for someone not like that could be a draw uh, to the game for someone not liking exactly the trick tech in general I have to say that uh, the combination of mechanics makes for uh, very active very fast games and oh okay that's the other thing I, I love about this the counter seems and oh okay that's the other thing I, I love about this the counters you 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 can counter any move at any moment you have always to be on your toes because uh, the first move you play wrong the opponent can take advantage of it so that's it possibly mm, fair enough I, I didn't play royal visit so i don't know what is exactly the draw you have uh, to that <laughs> Mm, mm. Oh, well, th that's a very intricate and delicate game, surprisingly, uh, for what it is. So, yeah. Oh, oh. I, I, ca I can say two compliments to this game. I have that. I have to say that the first is that I I couldn't really be bothered with uh, trick taking games. I think the first game I played a lot was the crew, and it was cool. But in the end, it was uh, still a plain trick taking game. And uh, of the of the tactics, uh, the mind games you play and everything, uh, this one uh, gets played a lot again. The the only other game so far that uh, catched my interest uh, so much with the uh, trick taking mechanism was Brian Boru, which is uh, and these are the only two games which make which made. Uh, trick-taking a viable uh, mechanism for me. 
So this is one compliment I can pay to this game. The other compliment is that uh, my wife l likes this game over Lost Cities. She plays short games, uh, uh, pretty easy to catch, uh, possibly with a way of retort because uh, she likes uh, uh, she li she likes cutthroat games. Uh, but uh, she's into Lost Cities because uh, it's fast, it's simple, it has uh, some kind of planning ahead. For a decade, we played uh, Lost Cities. She wants to play uh, Jekyll versus Side now. So I don't know if this will pass the test of time because it's too early to say, but this is the 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 the, the potential to be a classic. Oh, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, who knows? I'm just looking at the front cover right now, and there's this there's this very like smarmy looking yeah. blue man, and then there's two guys clearly trying to poop down below, yeah. on the left and right. That, that's a lot of struggling in the cover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, and that's I've always finding it a little confusing, um, but I do like the um, the London skyline. It's very iconic <laughs> and 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 pretty. Yeah, and the um, the Rorschach. That, that's uh, that's when some do try anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Vincent de Trade's done like loads of games I like, <laughs> such as Detective and Robinson Crusoe and Treasure Island and Robinson Crusoe and Treasure Island. So yeah. It's certainly going to look stylish. Yeah, that's illustrator royalty, basically. Yeah, well, um, speaking of stylish, then, uh, it's time to move on from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen to the League of Dominating the Silver Screen Non-Ordinary Gentlemen to the League of Dominating the Silver Screen Non-Stop. So Let's go, Marvel! Yeah. <laughs> Marvel Champions and its first big box expansion, The Rise of the Red Skull. Um both of which have been out for a while now, uh, but I've had a bit of a long journey with this. So, Marvel Champions is a game with this. So, Marvel Champions is a game I picked up in 2020 and then put on the shelf. I just didn't click with it at all. I had like a kind of awful time. Um, I tried learning it and stopping and learning it and stopping, and I was like, maybe this just isn't for me. Which was as a kind of my thing, and this is both. Um, so eventually I got back to it. Uh, and the thing that brought me back to it actually was the release of Sinister Motives. Um, but I've mostly been journeying back through the core game and the very first expansion, The Rise of the Red. From Caleb Grace, who's the guy, one of the guys behind Arkham Horror, the card game. And also to give them their credit, Michael Boggs and Nate French are the other two people who are credited as designers. It is, in all essence, as pure a boss battler as you could imagine. If you want to think of Kingdom Death, and what it is, the miniature represents two decks of cards. One which acts, the AI deck, and one which reacts, the hit location deck, the mind and body. And that essentially that's what you're fighting against. But you get to you get to do traditional war game combat against two decks of cards. This is combat against two decks of cards this is you get to play a deck of cards versus a separate deck of cards and it's pretty pick upable. as much as i said i struggled with it the problem was for me not the mechanics so much as the hook because the core game is just as the hook because the core game is just a collection of individual like fights against various characters and well, it just it didn't grab me because what I like about superhero stuff is the ongoing continuous stories. I mean, Elle stuff is the ongoing continuous stories. I mean, also not my favourite characters in the core box. Uh, you've got Captain Marvel, Iron Man, She-Hulk and Black Panther and, uh, uh, and also Spider-Man. And really, I only kind of care about Spider-Man. Black Panther, I, I've come to appreciate a lot more with the... Black Panther, I've come to appreciate a lot more with the movies, but he barely appeared in anything that I watched like when I was young and little. But Spider-Man was like all over the place. Um, none of these, though, are my favourite hero. There isn't even my favourite Spider-Man in this box. So, this box, so whatever. Uh, you will pick up a deck. And one of the neat things about this is, unlike Arkham Horror, 
you can just grab these and the starter decks are good enough. I hate the Arkham starter decks. I just they, they put one of each card in for the most part and it's just as you get multiple copies where uh, wherever it's appropriate and and half of your deck is always preset to the hero's set cards. The other half of it you pick a aspect and you get a little bit more choice but you can literally pick up the decks that they recommend in the core game. And so you have your hero card which has two sides. Love the concept of if you don't need to randomize a card use both sides of it. In this case you have the hero side where they get to do their punching and thwarting and fighting and use all their cool abilities and then their alter ego where where mechanically most of the time you switch to it to heal and to get to have a larger hand of cards uh, for example carol uh, danvers has six cards for her hand size but in captain marvel form she only has five uh, cards vary. You've got events which are like one shot. Uh, cards vary. You've got events which are like one shot things. You play them, they do the thing. And you've got allies. You put them into play and they can like also fight like mini heroes for you. Uh, and then they can also take a punch in the face and then like kind of fall off into the discard pile out of the combat. Maybe kind of fall off into the discard pile out of the combat. Maybe to come back a bit later. It's always quite funny when you're badly injured and you turn to like some poor sidekick. Uh, I, I don't know, let's, let's see. Who, who have we got in Carol's dick? A vision, yes. You turn to vision and you go, mm, could you hit point left? So how about you take eight damage? Cheers. It's kind of like a bit weird. Um, and then you also have upgrades, which basically give you more powers, more functions and abilities. All the card mechanics are kind of standard in that you tap cards to do things. You call them. And the neat part is how you pay for cards. You discard other cards from hand. Each card has a number in the top left corner that tells you how many resources you have to pay. Most cards are worth one resource. Uh, bottom left corner you can check. They have a type. Usually typing doesn't matter. There's uh, fists in... Uh, science which is the blue one and then there's a green one which is wild sometimes the cards care about the specific type but not always um, and that's really cool because you're constantly cycling through your hand you're making lots of decisions you've got five cards you go okay well I'm gonna play this I have to discard two cards I'll ditch those five cards you go okay well I'm gonna play this I have to discard two cards I'll ditch those two I've got two cards left okay am I gonna use these I'll use this one um, and then at the end of the turn, you can be like, am I going to keep this one or am I going to discard it? And then the villains get to have their turns and they're pretty straightforward. The villains get to have their turns and they're pretty straightforward. And they have decent scaling in that the villain will attack or scheme against every single player, the hero. They attack if you're in hero form. They scheme if you're not. And when they scheme, they advance their plan. So every villain has a card in play that has a number of players. Um, say it could be three per player or it could be 12 per player. It varies. And then when if you reach that threshold, then that part of their plan is completed. And you have to do follow the instructions and go to the next stage of their plan, which will be a card below. Sometimes the plan just says if they succeed at this, they, the real push and pull comes because you're thinking, well, I've got to punch this villain and deal damage to them to take them out. But I've also got to handle their scheme. If that gets out of control and gets too like big with too many threat numbers, I'm going to lose. But I'm badly injured. I need to recuperate. And I can only do that with my hero by switching to Steve Rogers and his apartment is a card. You know. Um, and it, it's a nice little push and pull. The game plays well solo. It plays well two player. Um, with three or four, it can get a bit chunky and slow. So I think it's best, like, as something you play with one other person. Um, like, as something you play with one other person. Um, unless you're all quite experienced. But not all things are created equal. So I dislike fighting every single one of the villains in the core box. You've got Rhino, who's fine as an introductory You've got Rhino, who's fine as an introductory, um, like, villain. 
he's trying to rob a bank or something, I think it is. He's just smashing face. Reasonable. Uh, there's, I think, Kang, who I played once, and I was like, mm, and never bothered again. Um, but again. Um, and, uh, is it the Kang? No, sorry, it's Claw. Kang's in one of the expansions that I don't own. Yeah, there's Claw, which is, eh, whatever. And Ultron, who was um, kind of fun to fight, but the trouble is this all lacked a sense of, is this all lacked a sense of progress and like story and, and epicness. And I think that's what resulted in me putting it on the shelf for a while, even though I do quite like superhero stuff, especially I love superhero role playing. And if you want to boff and punch face in a short period, this, if you want to boff and punch face in a short period, this, this ticks the box. Um, so I left it for a bit and then along came the, the rise of the Red Skull. And this is one of their like larger box things. And what they do is they release a, a two new heroes. They're designed, they can be played all independently and you can chop and change them all around and change the elements as you wish. Or you could play through a campaign. And that's the moment where I was like, okay, this is this is what I was looking for. This is cool. It also helped that my second favourite spider Spider-Mon is in Rise of the Red Skull, and that's uh, Jessica Drew. But playing through it, it's really good. You have like a straightforward fight against, uh, I think it's Crossbones, um, the first guy. I'm going to double check now because I get Crossbones and Taskmaster mixed up very often. Uh, and they're both in the same campaign. Yeah, it's Crossbones. Yeah, Crossbones, and he's like a weapons-based dude, and he, he even gets some experimental weapons mixed into his deck that they keep cropping up throughout the whole campaign. So whatever ones he steals, the other villains start using. Then after that, uh, Lady Hydra gets away. She's Jessica Drew's nemesis. I haven't talked about nemesis. Jessica Drew's nemesis. I haven't talked about nemesis. They're really cool. I need to remember to talk about that briefly. Um, and Absorbing Man crops up and tries to delay you. And the more he delays you, it has an impact later in the campaign. So you need to take him out quickly. Uh, then you get back and, oh boy, everything's changed. Uh, then you get back and, oh boy, everything's changed. And Taskmaster is like now the head of police and the, the, the Avengers Tower is now the head of Center of Hydra. And it's like, what the heck's going on? Uh, and you fight a really interesting fight where occasionally a prisoner will crop up the plan. And if you clear it, all the threat off it by thwarting it, then you get an ally. And suddenly that ally's there with you for the rest of the campaign, which was like, oh, that's really cool. And then you fight um, Mr. Gorgonzola. That's uh, the computer uh, guy. Uh, I mean, Zola, Zola. yeah. Yeah. And builds up you get a little bit of upgrading you get your choice of like um, a one-shot ability for the after the first scenario you get a uh, a basic static power in after the second one then in the third one you might get some allies and interestingly the longer you stall that fight the more of the allies you can get so there's a take a bit longer and get some more help for near the end of the campaign uh, but dragging it out runs your resources quite ragged so you have to balance that then when you beat Zola, you get to upgrade your basic power, flip it over, another side, more powerful version. Super fun. I, I really liked it. It's not the best campaign. Really liked it. It's not the best campaign. It really isn't. But it's very good as your first campaign. Uh, also, I suppose I should just briefly say you get Hawkeye in the box as well. But I mean, it's Hawkeye. Hawkeye's a mediocre Avenger. I, I like the Hawkeye's a mediocre Avenger. I, I like the series, I enjoy it, but on this big stage, you know, Hawkeye's not my not my guy. Yeah, I, I, I was about to say that the series what uh, the, the the spotlight uh, where the moment to shine of Hawkeye, and it's a good Christmas story anyway. <laughs> the moment to shine of Hawkeye, and it's a good Christmas story anyway. <laughs> it's a good Christmas story, but it was really. Um, 
undermined a bit for me by the sheer excitement of uh, a returning character from a series who yeah they're devils yeah. <laughs> yes yeah and then of course the this yeah, they're the devils yeah. <laughs> yes yeah and then of course the the second confirmation of the said ca- another character returning in uh, Spider Man no and No Way Home yeah exactly yeah yeah it was all like that was fantastic I was I really enjoyed No Way Home by the way for somebody who adore spider-man um the way for somebody who adores spider-man um i liked the way no way home capstoned off not just the current arc for spider-man but both of the previous spider-man movies yeah it tied it all of them it, it, how they managed to do it was fantastic i don't know but yeah, yeah if we want to open this parenthesis uh no way home but uh, doctor strange is just okay to me yeah okay i i won't say anything more because we could be we, we, we could get some uh serious feedback if we spoil something now so <laughs> well, <laughs> well first of all you probably will we'll move on and uh i'll mention nemesis so every superhero has in their deck an obligation which is one card that's shuffled into the villain's deck and when it crops up it like it's, it's like a, a thing that gets in the way um and you have to deal with it, like, I think. Um, but also, there's one standard card that's mixed into every single setup that triggers a nemesis to turn up. And what happens if you draw that card is whoever's drawn it for their encounter for the turn, boom, they have to get their specific nemesis, stick it down in front of them, and shuffle all of the other four cards to do with that nemesis's plot. Dear, so-and-so's turned up, and they're, they're now giving you what for? Um... And I, I really like that mechanic as just kind of adding a bit more variance and a bit more story into the whole thing. So that's good. Now, my main criticism is each out of the box, but they give you no dials, no tokens, and most seriously of all, they don't give you access to the standard box in any of the small ones. So you're always forced to buy the main champion's box if you can't somehow get to the missing cards on the secondary market. You can replace the dials, replace the dials, you can replace the tokens, you can get the rules online, but those seven cards that get mixed into every single deck, they're missing. And I I think that's kind of not a very customer-friendly move. Um, on top of that, they have artwork of... Um, characters from the they have artwork of um characters from the marvel champions core box and rise of the red skull but if you're playing like guardians of the galaxy galaxy's most wanted why the heck does a card have red skull's face printed on it it just <laughs> they missed an opportunity to just put a standard deck into each of these larger boxes missed an opportunity to just put a standard deck into each of these larger boxes and just give someone Hey, I want the two-player standalone experience. I'll just get this instead of having to buy the big box and then get the expansion they care about. That's um, legit. I think that's my biggest complaint. Ridge the bottom. So if you've ever tried storing cards in a file system with a smooth plastic bottom, the cards fall all over the place and fall down flat. Uh, it's it's very annoying. Like they just needed to ridge ridge the bottom and add some texture to it so didn't like that annoying so i'm very quickly going to just tell you what i think is the best stuff to get you have to get the champion's box i would recommend considering getting a red skull rising uh, as a, a, a introductory to the campaigns um, because it's quite nice an experience and it's decent but I think it's only the third best of the four campaigns they've released. So, uh, Ga- uh, Gal- Guardians of the Galaxy, so that's Galaxy's Most Wanted, I think is the worst of the lot. I actually had some very frustrating times playing it and not like, ooh, I'm looking forward to beating this. We had some very frustrating times playing it and not like, ooh, I'm looking forward to beating this challenge. More like, can we just get this over with? This one is really not fun. Um... Above that, I would put Rise of the Red Skulls the third best. And then I would put Sinister Motives as the second best. The one problem put Sinister Motives as the second best. The one problem with Sinister Motives is it it needs two heroes. 
you you could play the other campaigns with a single hero. You can solo true solo play them, but Sinister Motives has some scaling in it that crushes you if you're just one hero. So you end up having to play two handed. Really good, and it's got my favourite Spider Man in it as well, a and my second favourite Spider Man. So um, Sinister Motives gets a bit of a thumbs up, but the best one is the Mad Titan Shadow, which is where you go up against Thanos, and it's fantastic. It's really, really, really good. It's got Spectrum characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe yet, but Spectrum has appeared pre her gaining her Spectrum powers, and Adam Warlock's had some Easter eggs, so they're, they're, they're interesting characters. That's the main like recommendation, is Mad Titan's Shadow is really good, and it's that whole Infinity super cool. The other one is, if you're looking just for good, powerful heroes, my personal top picks are uh, Spectrum, I think it's pretty decent. Uh, Spider-Woman's very good. Gamora is the old uh, Spider-Woman's very good. Gamora is the only Guardian of the Galaxy who I enjoy playing. Um, Miles Morales is my second favourite Spider-Man. And he's pretty good. And in the core box, Captain Marvel is a very good hero. But, like the four, a very good hero. But, like the four, who, who I would say are my favourites, and I think are the most powerful, are Captain America, Venom, Ghost Spider, who's my favourite Spider-Man. That's Gwen Stacy from Earth 65, I think, is the number. Um, Mr. Motives, along with Miles Morales. Um, I love how she plays. Like once I finally started playing with her, I was like, "This is my jam." She she has a style of like she defends and then uh, defends and attacks and like retaliates. Um, so she's very reactively orientated rather than direct offense. If you want to be on another level and just have an absolute powerhouse hero, um, do you want to take a quick stab at who might be the best hero in the game? You did mention his movie earlier. I don't know the heroes. Uh... Doctor Strange. Yeah, I, I guess. Doctor, yeah. <laughs> Doctor Strange. It's really fun to play as him, uh, especially if you're struggling. And he's a good launching platform to go up into the higher difficulties. But uh, yeah, he's he's really powerful. On the other end of the spectrum, Hulk bad. <laughs> Hulk real bad, which is a shame. So spe Spellcaster uh, still the show once again. Well, champions, uh, I'll probably touch back on this in a few years when some more stuff has come out. Uh, but it's a really enjoyable, good boss battler. I just wish it was a little bit more customer friendly on getting into it. Um, that you didn't have to shell out for this box that might contain five heroes you don't care about and a bunch of scenarios you never opens. But, you know, it could be worse. It could have been the original Arkham Horror distribution method. <laughs> Okay, we got this. We we cleared this. <laughs> the... mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have you played it much, Alessio? Oh no, no. Uh, if you mean um, if you mean uh, Marvel Champions, not not at all. If you play, if you mean uh, original Arkham Horror, I mean, yes. I mean Marvel Champions. Yeah, uh, yeah we'll, no. We'll no. talk about we'll talk about Arkham Horror sometime in the future. Yeah, um, I, I will probably yeah. be of better company there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. But anyway, that's that's fine. But if you did enjoy Arkham, I know. We'll no. talk about we'll talk about Arkham Horror sometime in the future. Yeah, um, I, I will probably yeah. be of better company there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. But anyway, that's that's fine. But if you did enjoy Arkham Horror, uh, this. This is a more fighty version. I think I like Arkham Horror's unveiling of the story and moving around and the way it uses. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. But anyway, that's that's fine. But if you did enjoy Arkham Horror, uh, this is a more fighty version. I think I like Arkham Horror's unveiling of the story and moving around and the way it uses the cards as a board to explore. Um, but as a boss battler goes, I think Marvel Champions is. Marvel Champions is definitely one of the really good ones. Primal's got its work cut out if he wants to be better than this. Well, yeah, uh, I can bring home from this that uh, it's a boss battler and I should actually play a campaign because it's a lot better. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Let's go and it ships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. 
Uh, right, so finally, to cap off this episode, it's Kara's Tocket, which is going to be an intricate, electrifying thread of a game. Take it away, Kara. Okay, um, yeah, I'm talking about Stormweavers. Ah, well, Eastern European name with too many consonants. Um, I'm very sorry. Let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's have a bit of fun and all try and pronounce that. Siemski. Siemski. Zimski, yes. That's where I'd land. Yeah. Okay. So s- somebody go get Martian on the phone. Um, b- before I continue, I have to say I kind of like it, but I have a lot of things I don't like about the game. <laughs> Great. Review done. So, Let's um, go home. That's, that's not how you do the review, Lassio. You, <laughs> you start off talking about it, praising it, and then you do the mid-review turnaround. To stop this, I want to hear about this game because... I'm looking at it and I'm seeing this pink worm and I'm excited. I want to hear what's good and what's no, not good. So, shh. What is this game? It's um, basically a choose your own adventure book. Yeah, you, you have this in the box, which is way too big for the game, in my opinion, and some extra sheets and then these. And um, you play, it's a solo game so you can't play with multiple people you play as a dwarf whose name i actually forgot um and i mean oh simon uh. and um and um diamond is a regular old dwarf um uh, mercenary um and uh this isn't really a spoiler, it's just what happens after the introductory in a, in a battle. He gets hurt and returns home, and at home things happen. And um, then you are in the dwarven um, home city and land, and um, it's kind of an open world game. It's kind of an open world game, I'd say. Um, you have this uh, map. It comes with these nice scratch off maps, or at least one of them, I think, and um, where you can um, reveal the locations one after another. And, um, reveal the locations one after another. And um, yeah, you read paragraphs, you make decisions, you go to different paragraphs, you roll dice for checks, etc. And yeah, it's a choose your own adventure style book with some role playing elements. Adventure style book with some role playing elements. I say um, you have your character sheet with some stats on it. Um, And combat, in combat you have these very nicely illustrated um, small combat sheets, uh, combat grids where you can um, fight it out against enemies. And um, that's basically it. That's what this game is about. I think important to know, it's not a role-playing game. And um, it has aspects of one, but um, in role-playing games, you start by creating your own character. Here, but of your, let's see, uh, basically six stats. Four are fixed at the start, and uh, two are your main stats, dexterity and wisdom. Both have can distribute four additional points, however you would like between those. And that's that's it for the character creation. That's the only decision you can make. And um, that was actually kind of eh, <laughs> when I started. Um, and then Cerritus is used for fighting mainly. Um, you know, if you attack an enemy, you roll your de- you roll a die and add it to your dexterity, and the enemy rolls a die and adds it to their dexterity, and then you compare it and see whoever is higher deals damage. And wait, um, that's that's almost exactly the kind of mechanic used in the fight. Roll a dice, add your stat versus like roll, they roll their dice and add a stat. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a very light game, to be honest. Um, combat, as I said, yeah, both characters, or your character and the enemy, both roll 1d6 at their dexterity, whoever rolls a combat, 
and then you calculate damage which is normally the difference but if you have like armor it reduces the damage you get if you have a weapon bonus it increases the damage you deal and and that's it if you do a uh, an ability test like during your uh, reading the story and then you have to make you can do something you roll 2d6 add them together and if it's less or equal to your dexterity or wisdom um, whatever you roll against um, you succeed and um, that's like 90 percent of the game mechanics um, there are some there are some special attacks um, like you can charge which means if you attack after you move two spaces um, you add one to your attack roll um, then flanking if you are surrounded by two or more enemies uh, they then flanking if you are surrounded by two or more enemies uh, they get a bonus or well, no you get a uh, you, your dexterity gets lowered um, then you have this cunning strike which is actually kind of interesting um, so if you would decide at the start that you put strike which is actually kind of interesting um, so if you would decide at the start that you put all your four free points in wisdom um, making you worse at combat you could decide to make cunning strikes and which means you make a check against your wisdom and indeed you deal three damage to the enemy if you fail you get three damage um, so if you have a high enough wisdom it might actually be worth it um, then there is push if you deal three damage in one go or more the enemy gets pushed two spaces back together with a cunning strike which deals three damage um, and if you push push an enemy into an obstacle they gain an additional damage um, yeah and now we actually covered <laughs> yeah you you haven't said that the standees uh, look look cute i don't know what they um, there are two types of uh, standees the regular ones are normal cardboard standees and um, then at least through the Kickstarter you could get um, acrylic standees. Um, I have them both and honestly I wonder about all this hype around acrylic standees. I don't <laughs> know. I think these are the first acrylic standees I got and I don't know if they are comparably bad ones or if people are just weird that they <laughs> like these so much um um i the big thing for me is the acrylic standees that came in vagrant song are so characterful the artwork on them is absolutely fantastic um and uh, i really appreciated not not having another game that i felt obligated to paint yeah but yeah. i mean acrylic standees versus versus cardboard standees where you also would have the artwork mm. on yeah um well, obviously, for me, I'd say cardboard standees are the way to go most of the time because they are more environmentally conscientious, being made of trees. Um, it does help to made of trees. Um, it does help to uh, paint the edges of cardboard standees. Yeah, the sharpie, the sharpie three. Yeah, sharpie yeah. them or black paint them. Yeah. Um, it's the same with tokens. If you're willing to do it, when you edge the tokens, it makes a real difference as opposed to having exposed cardboard. Uh, but I mean, difference as opposed to having exposed cardboard. Uh, but I mean, uh, to be honest, if somebody said to me, you can have cardboard standees or acrylic ones, um, I would probably pick the cardboard ones. Unless I'm going to play the game a lot. Yeah, I mean, actually, because of a lot of discussions online and... Um, I got them for this game because I thought, oh yeah, they're really so nice. And now I'm sitting here and yeah, sure, I use them because I got them. And I would feel really stupid to not use them, but the cardboard ones. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, the colors are a little bit more. Yeah, there, there's some glare, some a little bit more glare than on cardboard ones. And yeah, uh, anyway. Um, reflections, stuff like that. So, um, going off on a tangent there. Uh, <laughs> no, no.
No, 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 not at all. It's fine. Like components matter, and uh, plastic in games is something we you got to, as a consumer think about: is it worth it or not? I just pulled up images of the two, and um, I think yeah, I think I'd be fine with cardboard ones for this. Yeah, yeah, I think I'd be fine with cardboard ones for this. Yeah, especially um, I hadn't thought about it, but. Um... I noticed one problem I had was when playing on my gaming table um, and looking like from up high down on it I f and looking like from up high down on it I found it difficult to, to differentiate between them and when I saw on Board Game Geek someone posting a picture where they took from the um, setup diagrams in the book uh, made scans of the uh, pictures they used there to show where what which enemy goes and created like flat tokens of them and that's when i thought this is a really good idea especially for such a game which has all the markings of like a, a really compact if you just you know take the book put your sheet and the battle grids on top of it and then just a layer of tokens and that's it um, which would make it really easier and easier to, you know, if you look down on it to to mm. you know, to, to differentiate everything. So um, yeah, it's it's a very good point, and it's the old class, and you've got terrain that can obscure parts of the miniature, and you're trying to think about line of sight for shooting. So like the old classic Games Workshop nineteen nineties games, miniatures really mattered because you'd look and be like. Is that game, is that miniature 50% covered or is it like more than 50% covered, etc, uh, etc. Et um, but it's representation, yeah, like tokens. Yeah, there was this guy who made uh, the, these, these big coasters representing uh, Kingdom Death uh, miniatures as tokens. Uh, the Phoenix was impressive. I, I, I think they are in the file section of of the KDM, uh, for, I think you can download and print them on heavy cardboard. They are cool, but yes, it's an eternal struggle. People who get standees or miniatures want tokens. People with tokens makes miniatures, so there's actually <laughs> not making everyone happy here. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. Um, other things I don't like about this game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can decide to put more points in dexterity or more in wisdom, but the problem is it's not like you have a lot of choice in what tests you will encounter. Yeah, it's it's choice in what tests you will encounter. Yeah, it's it's not like you usually have the choice to approach something in different ways or so. And then if you put all your points in wisdom and suddenly you have to make a dexterity check, it's just it just sucks and there's no way around you have to make a dexterity check it's just it just sucks and there's no way around it the same way if it's if it, if you did it the other way around and the book actually recommends in your first game to just spread it evenly and um yeah then um the, game, the, the character sheet is pretty simple. You have a picture of uh, your dwarf, you have uh, your different stats, you have an entry for gold, one for health, and a health bar, and then equipment, um, where you can write down equipment. Um, on the back side, you have a um, space for to, to draw your map. They actually recommend to draw a map, but I got the scr this scratch off map, so I decided I don't need to draw a map and uh, the relevant story entries have a symbol um, on them so you know which part of the map to scratch off and then i i think um so i just played and suddenly i encountered a, a story entry that basically said if you did encounter this person before do this if not do this and i realized I should really take note of what I do. And th there was no warning in the game. So if you play this game, make notes of encounters you had, of people you found, of things you have or had. Um, it might be relevant. 
You, you know, by, by your description, I would say like a roller right game with the addition of a combat board. I, I begin to think this sounds a lot like two games that I rate very highly, um, which is Legacy of Dragonhold from Fantasy Flight Games, which does a choose your own adventure for one to six players, one to six players, um, and it's really good, and role player adventures, which I think I've probably talked about previously on here, which again has a lot of that kind of stuff going on, but has dice based combat instead. Um, but this sounds lighter and easier. My big question, um, uh, lighter and easier. My big question, um, uh, which I, I'm curious about, it, was there, apart from being open worlds, so you're kind of choosing where to go, was there much feeling of a branching path based decisions where, it, like, something you do would lock something off or change some occurrence anywhere? <laughs> change some occurrence anywhere? <laughs> Another thing I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, I don't have this feeling of um, an epic story I, I'm following. Yeah, it it really feels like, hey, I'm this dwarf one of, I don't know. Um, I just encounter things and react to them, and um, it starts with um, you getting a message of someone you. Uh, know from uh, before and um, who needs your help and so I started traveling in that direction until I couldn't because I encountered something which I couldn't pass at this moment so I decided okay um, I'll just look around so I started to look around and I got like some um, side quest and then I saw this and then I lost all my money due to a um, leading to me having basically the same stats I had when I started and no money to buy equipment or anything. Um, so I traveled in another direction, um, encountered some more interesting things and some enemies which were way too powerful for me to defeat without any equipment. So, uh, But the game continued. It's um, another thing I don't like. Um, <laughs> like I do like some type of randomness, um, some some amount of randomness, but I don't like when randomness get important things in a way that it's like, okay, either it's great or I lose. And um, dying is actually one of those because the game isn't necessarily over if you die, but it can be over. And dying can actually be good weirdly enough and dying can actually be good weirdly enough so it's <sighs> mm. yeah um but yeah so um i traveled north didn't work traveled e uh, traveled west didn't work so then i traveled east um didn't work um um didn't work um and so now, um, now after I died the second time, I have no idea what to do because basically in every direction there is some enemy or encounter I can't defeat right now and I have no money. direction there is some enemy or encounter I can't defeat right now and I have no money to um, uh, buy equipment and get better. <laughs> The way you're describing it there, it, it sounds a bit like the adventures of this unemployed dwarf. He's like, I went north and it didn't work. And I went south and it didn't work. I went east and it didn't work. And by the sit sit system, is this like a critique of capitalist society? Is this a post-capitalist society? Is that why he's a dwarf? Because dwarves are like the ultimate capitalists. Maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, I actually only found two ways to make money. One of those, you need money because it's like gambling. You once in the game, it specifically says, says so. Yeah, you, you can take like a small job and earn some money and you can only do this once. I did it and then I gambled to get enough money to actually buy something and I lost it. So, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's in this game. <laughs> The world's most unfortunate dwarf. <laughs> and it's really frustrating because every time th th there are, uh, are many things where we're like, hey, um, yeah, you can buy this, but if you have this item, 
you can get it for free and just pay with this item. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have... <laughs> um, so, uh, it is, uh, is this game a good uh, birthday present? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, as I said at the start, I kind of like this game. I will definitely try it again. I don't think I will continue my current campaign. I just start new and try not to get robbed this time. Um, please, please do come back and like revisit it briefly in one of our like <laughs> opening chats once you've done for a second opinion. Because I, I, I in chats once you've done for a second opinion. Because I, 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 I've actually like entranced and amused by this concept of just absolute abject misery. This is this poor dwarf trudging around and unable to do anything. It's it, it sounds frustrating to play, but really funny as a concept. Yeah. Frustrating to play, but really funny as a concept. Yeah. Um, another thing which is actually more uh, a more substantial criticism. The rules are quite vague sometimes. It's, um, for example, enemy movement. For example, enemy movement. The only thing you know from the rules about enemy movement is how many spaces they move nothing else and um, that can lead to a lot of situations where you are like okay if suddenly you have some special rules and encounter like hey if they the enemy is in this area they have reduced movement speed but then you have an enemy which moves through this area and you want to how, how does it affect them now and and um, so I, I feel like in a lot of cases in this game, it's like the designer needed someone to, to you know, check the rules, look for um, ambiguity and clear things. The designer needed you uh, playing it so you could have it reported this terrible experience and mean like, look, if I'm stuck and I've got no money and I can't fight anything and, and I'm in a terrible situation, uh, is there somewhere I could go? Can I like retire in a in a little hovel and just have an ending where my miserable dwarf lives his miserable life? The really funny and frustrating thing is I actually know one way out of this misery, <laughs> which is dying. Um, <laughs> I as I told you, dying can mean the end of the game, but it can also mean good things. <laughs> <laughs> so. I could try and end the game, um, which I, is weird. I, I died. Well, not so bad. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the old classic quote, isn't it? A curious game seems like the only way to win is not to play. Oh, this was the only way to win is to die. <laughs> seems like the only way to win is not to play. Oh, this was the only way to win is to die. <laughs> <laughs> I love this game. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I will start again now that i know some things um like where to go and where what is and i will 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 come back and uh, tell you and i will 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 come back and uh, tell you about my renewed experience please do i i hope it's one that on a second experience when you've had a little bit of like time to run in and fall over um all over the place repeatedly uh, then when you come back to it and you've got a little bit of knowledge that you can get things rolling and maybe send the snowball in the other direction. You'll probably come back and be like, oh, well, the problem with it now is I knew what to do. It was just too easy. I ended up driving an M18 Abram tank through everything. I, you know, found that lying around and managed to make my roll to get it working and all the enemies were just to forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not all dwarves have tanks, but this game yeah, is this hilarious yeah. shouldn't have <laughs> yeah warhammer dwarves have tanks or they could do is it empire has tanks whatever it doesn't matter um yeah it's it sounds fascinating um and it um and i've played a couple of the old uh choose your own adventure games as well and it feels like you're talking about a designer who played those and really loves those where 
the only way to play them is to have your thumb in the book because when you make a decision and the game goes and you're dead and you're like how was I supposed to know this was how was I supposed to know this was going to kill me I, c I could walk up a staircase or go through a door to the left I went through a door to the left and died oh that's the, my warning uh, the, the, the tomb of the basic D&D &D, the one of Vigeri Gygax uh, the, the tomb the tomb of the eternal uh, something oh the, the, that's eternal uh, something oh the, the, that's famous uh, you are oh, the yeah, tomb that yeah. I yeah the horrible one with really sexist content yeah is it the temple of elemental evil um or is it the t tomb of something? I, I think I it was a remake. Uh, I, I think I it was a remake. Uh, Efka now I talked worries. about it. Gary mm. Gygax. Tomb of Horrors. Yeah. The Tomb of Horrors, yes. Yes, that's right. Tomb of Horrors is, is yeah, just to throw bodies at the problem until you find the one true path through, yeah. Not something I would ever want to play, except maybe as a computer game where you can save and reload. So, thumb in the book again. Yeah, it's no robot commando. Hmm. Well, uh, that that I the game. I definitely want to hear more about it in the future, and I hope your second time through uh, is a bit less frustrating. And if anyone very... wants to make a u really useful community created content or add-on for this game, it would be a list with like, um, not, really not really achievements, but like encounters, like, like story uh, points that you could just check off. Yeah, so <laughs> that you like, hey, you read story 119 and then you just check it off. So um, you, you can just, you, you don't have to write everything down. You just, yeah, that's something like that. You, you can just, you, you don't have to write everything down. You just, yeah, that's something like that that would help. Yeah, that's one of the nice things that both, uh, well, Legacy of Dragon Halt and role, uh, role player Adventures and, of course, Sleeping Gods All Do is have a way of tracking that things have happened. Sleeping Gods All Do is have a way of tracking that things have happened. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Um, well, <sighs> That's uh, with that dwarven adventure. It means that rock and stone. We are out of time for this podcast. So thank you for listening to the Last Standy. You can catch us over at Doas as the Last Standy on Twitter, or subscribe in your preferred podcast app, or even I believe watch us on YouTube. Yeah. Or at least listen to us on YouTube. Yes. So it's farewell from Alessio. Bye. Kara. Auf Wiederhören. And myself, for Carl. And remember that the second... E